Good evening. Good evening. My name is Paul Holdengraber. I'm the Director of Public Programs here at the New York Public Library. It's a great pleasure to have you here. My goal here at the library, as you know, is to make the lions roar, to make a heavy institution levitate, if possible. Hello, everyone. Today is another one of those more personal episodes with someone I've known a long time, a man named Paul Holden Graber. I first met him when I was a student in New York City. In some strange way, we ended up in similar publishing circles and became friends. And this was around the same time that he was becoming something of a famous man in uh, this literary world of New York City. And the events he was building were at the New York Public Library in the Stephen Schwartzman building, with these two big lions out front, a couple of blocks from Grand Central on 42nd Street. If you've been to Bryant Park, it's that giant building framing the park. And when you go inside and up two floors, up these big staircases, you come to the Rose Reading Room, this big sort of almost church-like space with these murals of clouds on the ceilings and circular chandeliers and it, it might sound kind of kitschy but it feels very luxurious it makes you feel like you're part of something special sitting there all day studying which I did a lot and at the end of those days quite often it would be a really sweet reward to walk out of that gorgeous cavernous reading room down a few flights of stairs and into another very spectacular space that's part of this huge New York Public Library building called the Celeste Bartos Forum because that was where Paul, as the director of public programming, would hold his events. I'd hear him talk with Rebecca Solnit or Yoon Pilari, Jay-Z, Mike Tyson, Christopher Hitchens, Pete Townsend, Zadie Smith, Adam Phillips, who Paul really loves and mentions a lot in this conversation, Marina Abrovich, Margaret Outwood, Bill Clinton, and John Hope Franklin. It would just went on and on. There were so many people at these events But the events themselves were very special. It wasn't just another talk. It was a real event. There was something about being in that room, being in that landscape of conversation that was created. So that's why I reached out to him to talk, because he does create landscapes of conversation. At least I've experienced him doing that many times. And as I've started to imagine conversations as landscapes and what a power it is to have them and be changed by them and be in them, I've started to wonder, what is a conversation? How, how does this happen? And should we even think about it too much? So Paul is definitely a sort of curator or conductor of conversations. And I talked to him a little bit about how that came to be in his own life and what it means for him. Paul's also just a really interesting conversation partner in his own right, probably the only person in the world to ever get a recommendation letter from Foucault. Paul calls himself a quotomaniac by profession. Uh, he's, he likes to say he's a digressor. He, and he does often digress and steer away from his own biography, but he does talk of his parents a lot. He obviously loves them very deeply, and they shaped him in all sorts of ways, not least by having escaped the Nazis uh, the last minute, sort of, in 1938, fleeing Vienna, and then only meeting and finding one another in Haiti. Here we talk a bit about what conversation means, the power of it, the art of it, what it does to us, Paul's own path, some of the challenges he's had to face or is facing now, the landscapes, and I just want to thank Paul for for all the conversations he's gifted over these years, and I hope you enjoy this conversation. I hope you also look at some of Paul's other conversations, which I'll be sure to put in the show notes. Also hope you're doing well, wherever you are, and whatever landscapes you're moving through. There's always been a quest for truth, and nobody knows what it is. I think there was some sort of a, a ballad taken where the pulse felt among philosophers, 2,000 worldwide, what is truth? And they had no real answer. Nobody can explain and declare what truth actually is, we do not know. And and I keep thinking that that is a real blessing. Uh, That's the first time I hear such a thing, yes. Uh, I I do agree, sometimes things do not need to be fully explained. We cannot explain it. A very good question, most of the time, is better than a very good answer. 
we were trying yeah, to figure I, out how we had met and it was somehow through Berlin. It was so lovely to hear from you. I must say it, it sort of made my heart beat a bit stronger. I was really <laughs> very, very pleased. I may or may not have told you that I wanted to teach a class once on digression. And I really only had the first line of the class. The class was, this is a class on digression. But before I begin, anyway. <laughs> uh, anyway, anyway That's a good me, one. It's a good one. Um, this yeah. was, first, and it's true, the very first year I taught at Williams College, a hundred years ago, when I was a pretend scholar, I, I, had this idea already back then that it really would be interesting to teach a class on digression. And I'm sure already then I knew the wonderful line of Lawrence Stern, who said that mm -hmm. digression is the sunshine of narrative, which was something that stayed in my mind forever. And about 15 years ago, Princeton, where I, I got my graduate degree a hundred years ago, had been asking me again and again if I would come and give a talk um, in in the humanities departments. Um, they invite people usually to show them, this is kind of fitting for, for your conversation, to show that people who have studied literature, not neuroscience, but literature in the humanities, may have a future. And they believe probably that I had a future. They had invited the year before David Remnick, who also had a future. Obviously. What year are we talking about now? About fifteen years. Uh, about okay. fifteen years ago, maybe maybe only ten years ago. Okay. Probably. Yeah. Only 10 I think years. you already had a pretty clear future. <laughs> I had a future, and, and now we can and talk about the future, mm -hmm. which is a little a little more uh, uh, of an issue. But um, I kept saying to Princeton, I don't give talks. I don't give talk. I talk, but I don't give talks. There is a big difference. Yeah, yeah. Big difference. And I said, you know what? And I said, you know what I like doing? I like talking to people. As mm -hmm. I'm talking, conversation you know, to is a little different than yeah, giving a talk. Um, very, or giving very, a talk, maybe, but a lecture and all this is a very lecture strange. is not my not thing your word at all. No, no, no. Also, because I wouldn't know how to structure it, and I kept saying no every year. Mm -hmm. And then finally, I thought, okay, they really want me, and it's very lovely to be desired. And mm -hmm. I said, why don't I interview someone? Or why doesn't somebody interview me? Mm -hmm. Which is something that people had kept saying. And Adam Phillips, a psychoanalyst I much mm -hmm. admire, he kept saying. I saw, you, I saw you talk to him in New York quite a few yeah, times. Yeah, I'm sure. Great we've, talks. We've done it a few times. And Adam... Um, Adam who Kissing, great... tickling, and being bored. And, Is that the... and being bored. And and he has a great line in the Paris Review. I, I quote it because I, I did an, a Paris Review interview with him. The only Paris Review interview in the 75 years of the Paris Review that has a psychoanalyst as a subject of an interview. I think you would enjoy it, by the way. And if you can't find it, let me know. I know it's behind paywalls, but I can get mm -hmm. it to you. And yeah. he says that digression is secular revelation, which is beautiful. Digression very is secular revelation. revelation. It's very interesting. It's very, I mean, it's a version of sunlight of the yeah, it is. sunlight it's of narrative, isn't it? Except, but with, mm -hmm. Oh, and so I said, I have an idea. Why don't we have, because Adam kept saying, next time I'm interviewing you, mm. which of course I've never let happen because my goodness, to be interviewed by a psychoanalyst, I can that think about something. it might be more pleasurable. But at any rate, um, <laughs> I, uh, I haven't yet submitted myself. Maybe I will before I die. Oh, but I thought I, we were leading I, up to it happened, and I was going to say, how did no, I miss this? But, okay. I, I, said, I said to Princeton, to the, to the head of the complete department, I said, I have an idea. Mm. Why don't we ask my advisor, Victor Brombert, to interview me? Now, Victor, mm. at that point, was 90. Day before yesterday, he turned 100. Oh, wow. Happy birthday to he's, him. He's a wonderful, wonderful man. This was your advisor at Princeton? B yeah, B-R-O-M-B-E-R-T. He wrote the most beautiful books on French literature, on the idea of the prison in literature. He's just written a book um, at the age of 100 called Musings on Mortality, Ooh. and another book called The Pensive Citadel, which just came out. I mean, imagine that. 
And he does oh, remind me good. of my father in the sense that my father at age 97, when people would ask him when he would retire, he said, I'm too old to retire. But at any rate... Um, <laughs> Paul, let's start there, actually. Let's start where I am, which okay. is close to where your father has been, was, is still. And that, guess where I am right now? Leuven. Jena. No. no. Belgium. No. Yes, I'm in Leuven. I think I say it wrong because there's Leuven. the L E U V A N. I never know how to at, say at it. The, right. At the Flemish, the yes, Flemish the Flemish Leuven. Leuven. What are yeah. you doing there? I'm here visiting a friend. She's at the law school. She has a um like a visiting thing that just happens to be only this time that I could come see her. So it's a little bit interesting that wow. that's where I am. Yeah, that's where I am right now in a hotel room. And I just realized, isn't this kind of the area that your parents eventually came back to? And you too, maybe as a teenager or as a boy? Or... You, you remember you remember things well, yes. So my parents, okay. so, you know, my parents left Vienna just in time. My father left the day before the last day you could leave Vienna in June 1938. Well, uh, my parents met in Haiti. Uh, my so father... they f your dad fled to Haiti, right? And your mom. Fled... And or... my mother separately. Separately, my but father, both from Austria? both from Vienna, both from Vienna, both met in Haiti. There were 137 Jewish families in Haiti. They met there. They were married in Haiti. They remained married until they both died. Uh, at the age, they uh, my mother was 89. My father was 97. They were yeah. married for. 71 years it's amazing i remember you visiting them often yeah, in belgium i think around here but i didn't have uh, very, an very, image of very it much i i went the year i went to uh, undergraduate school when i studied philosophy and law i went to louvain la neuve they had Which just is, separated the, that's the french one that's like that's an hour french from here right or it's something. an hour okay. from here you know they, re they separated the library in two in a very belgian way um, volume one, three, five, and seven was in one university, two, four, six, and eight in another. They separated <laughs> the orchestra with the Flemish speaking violinist and the French speaking uh, violinist. Oh, wow. It's crazy. Amazing country. you say that because we were just at the law faculty and there's those yeah. double staircases. Yeah. And there are kind of two staircases right beside each other. And my friend asked, why, why, why was it built like this? And it was like, oh, because the French students and the Flemish students didn't want to interact, so they had to have separate staircases or something. It's amazing you should say that. When I visited Vienna with my father, he showed me two staircases hmm. um, going to the medical school, and the Jews were asked to take uh, a, a different staircase. It wasn't built for that purpose. Hmm. And then uh, the Nazis already at that point wanted to go up the staircases um, that they had designated for the Jews, and there were huge fist fights. Whoa. Father spoke to me about that. That's a whole other story. They went from Vienna to Mexico, and then, since you were mentioning this, um, for many reasons, my father became rather restless and decided he wanted his children to be get a European education. And so very much um, wandering Jew kind of way, we went from country to country, including back to Vienna, which where my mother started to speak German with a French accent. We went to Dusseldorf and to Zurich and to Lucerne, and then finally to Belgium, Brussels. Why Brussels? My father would have told you because Brussels was central. I'm not sure central to what, but it was central. And so we lived in Belgium, which is um, not the place where my mother was happy, not the place where I would have really wanted to grow up. Though, interestingly enough, um, I think a lot about Brussels now. It comes mm. back in my mind. And I was invited by a Pan-African literary festival to come to Brussels last year to give a keynote speech, which I did do. So I'm I'm not mm, consistent. So you do speak. Um, you do give I speeches. Do speak, I do give speeches mm -hmm. on the notion of what it means to return. Mm. And That's I quite remember powerful. Yeah, I remember telling a friend of mine that I would do this and he said, 
don't forget what Bob Dylan said about going back. You can always go back, but you always can come back, but you can't come back all the way. And so I mentioned all of that and spoke in a panel. I was nearly the only white person among all those people who, for whom the idea of home, of course, was much more complicated than for me. They were mm -hmm. from the Congo and from Senegal and from all kinds of different places. Mm -hmm. At any rate, yes, I did grow up in so far that I grew up. I did grow up in, in Brussels. It feels interesting that I came back here to talk to you because I associate Belgium with you, but only in the past few years, I've had some memories or images of it. And so it feels a little bit richer, but for some reason, I seem to remember you moved around a lot, even once you were here, didn't you? Or did, or is yeah, well, it more like I'm thinking no, no, of you no, reading you, lots you of books re or? No, you, know. well, uh, uh, reading books is a way of moving around, but mm -hmm. it wasn't, it wasn't that. It, you, you're absolutely right. I, I studied in Louvain and then I went, uh, after I studied philosophy there, I went to Paris. So I studied in Paris and in the real heyday of the waning of French intellectual, philosophical uh, greatness in some way. Right? So right because after I, all the big philosophers. Well, I studied are, with Foucault yeah. and I studied yeah, with yeah. Bach. You studied with, with Foucault? I didn't know that. Yeah, Foucault, Levy, Foucault wrote to me my letter of recommendation for Princeton. What? Wow. Two, two I mean, I knew you knew Levy it, it, and all it, those people, but it, it was it was two lines long. <laughs> what did it say? It, it, it said something like the premises of Holden Graeber's work on European nihilism seems to me well founded. <laughs> Michel Foucault. Wow, that's like a blurb. Said, you should be using. Yeah, it, it's like a blurb. I don't know where the letter is, but <laughs> I'm I am positive. That's that incredible, Paul. Wow. Princeton the professors were impressed not by me but by the letter I got yeah that he wrote I mean that's that, probably very unusual very but unusual. I, so I think I feel like okay maybe this is wrong but I have this image of you as like a teenage boy reading a lot and also moving around a lot didn't you walk a lot or maybe I we used to talk about walking a lot or driving or hitchhiking no or, no no you're you know you had right. this kind of restlessness yeah. too right you said your dad was yeah, restless very but... much and, and and still now so yeah. my father believed and I'll use the word he used my father believed that it was immoral for a boy to travel any other way than hitchhiking oh, your before, dad said he, before he reached the age of 21. So, and my mother didn't agree with my father. Where did this come from? This was just his big belief. Um, from his own past, okay. from thinking, from thinking, and I, th I owe my father my ability to talk. Hmm. That's a big thing. Because I was able to touch anyone. I just lost your sound right when you said you could talk. There you go. I lost, yeah. Um, I <laughs> a little think, joke from your dad there. I know. I think he um, <laughs> he believed very much that that um, that you need to be able to talk to anybody, and hitchhiking is a wonderful way of inventing your life. You know, you tell all kinds of stories, some true, some less true. And so I hitchhiked and I actually went to Vienna with my father. I went hitchhiking. He went by train and I was there earlier than he was because I went on these autobahns in Germany that were where people used to drive 200 kilometers an hour mm. and picked him up at, at the, I know, and picked him up at the train station. And he thought I had been on the train and um, that I just ran out to to greet him. That's beautiful. So is that really how you learned how to talk? Was no, that like I, a I, lesson in how to converse I, with anyone? This is the owl of Minerva taking its flight at dusk. It's me uh, believing. It's me making up a story about how I learned. You know, I have I have these packages. It does force that, one. Yeah. It it's a good one. It's it's probably there's probably some truths to that, but I did. I did, and you. It's amazing the memory you have. Uh, I really amazing because mm -hmm. um, what I did when I was fourteen or fifteen years old is I walked from the Lac de Constance to the Lac Le Mans in Switzerland by myself, having read Rainer Maria Rilke, Rilke. Mm -hmm. read the letters to a young poet. I took it to heart, and I imagined that um, 
that one had to be alone. And I took a backpack and for three weeks, I walked from one part of Switzerland to the other 300 and some kilometers on my own, sleeping in huts one night mm. and in tents another night. And so I did lead, I did lead now having children, I realized to what extent I led a somewhat a friend less solitary life. Um, my friends being books and music and and really I was completely devoid of any understanding, any understanding, knowledge or or any any contact with um popular culture. I mean, my wife Barbara is always amazed that I just know nothing. Yeah. I have a wonderful T-shirt. Mm -hmm. It's a cover of uh, an album by Joy Division that somebody gave me. And I i mean, I just didn't even know it was that. There's always been something of, of the solitary. I actually wanted to ask you about this next when you were talking before, because you studied philosophy. I studied philosophy. I, I understand what it is to get lost in books and be solitary and walk. I think that's why I remember your stories because we they were similar to mine. And it's a really solitary space, but yet you're also very voracious, gregarious, and so on in your public life with conversations. And you can, I could never have hitchhiked across anywhere at that age when I was in that philosophy bubble. So how did, how did these two worlds come together? I, I think to some extent, perhaps I was less in a bubble than you. Okay. Um, maybe my bubble had little holes. <laughs> um, so I, I always also love the contact with people, though I don't think I had very many deep friends. And I think friendship perhaps is something that I've developed later in life. Um, I, I feel like now I have some friends, though I would I would say that the idea, the notion of friendship is tremendously important to me. I don't think I've been particularly good at it. Um, Why not? But I do, I do create, I think I do create the illusion of friendship and proximity through these conversations. Well, I feel like you can go very deep with people. Um, but yeah, why, why do you think you're not a good friend? Is it that I, I think I don't maintain contact enough. I mean, um, you know, it's it's really a pleasure to speak to you now, but it's so odd that if we had something in common, why why didn't I stay in touch with you? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, we didn't. We both didn't really. I think you. No, I know. I mean, I'm not. Ways, I'm so. not actually. I'm not even. I'm not saying why didn't you stay in touch with me. <laughs> No, no, no. I'm, this is not the. Uh, but I'm, I'm illustrating it because I'm talking to you. But I would say this happens no, often. I, yeah, I, I, it I feel it about you. There's something about you that goes very deep, but also, um, it's not that you turn away. But I don't know. Is there? Are you? Maybe if, I, I think I try to put it back into the books, right? Where you can go really deep in the books because you can close the book at the end or something or. That's you know, a good, idea, good image. Yeah, there's some there's something about not having to maintain that depth in a consistent way that allows one to go deep. It's hard to maintain that stuff over time and space. Uh, I remember from your time in New York. I mean, that takes a lot of energy, and it it gets you know people just assume it will happen. It's not an easy thing. It's not an easy space to create, right? So I don't know. Maybe that's part of it too. That you just energy wise, it's very hard to once people know you can go there they think you should just always be there in that deep space maybe that's uh, yeah. so interesting it, it reminds me of of what happens when i'm quiet in places and people wonder if i'm okay yeah exactly. um you know, which is which is a very uh, peculiar kind of reaction but i understand it and and it it probably does have something to do with the notion that a conversation for me is performative yeah. And and it isn't. I'm not. I'm not quiet. Um, I bring my body. Mm -hmm. I'm very present. I'm. Uh, I'm. I'm present. I try to maintain the space also in terms of what you mentioned earlier. The silences. I try not to fill them at all. I don't mind the discomfort. 
But I think like an actor who might be on, on stage, they might be off, off stage. And so I, I think there's something of that that happens to me. Um, and, you know, without uh, using you as my psychoanalyst at this moment, there probably is in me um, a fear um, of intimacy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to say that earlier, but I thought it if it's true, you probably wouldn't want to hear it. <laughs> well, now that I've said it, I heard it. <laughs> that you, I, it's better <laughs> that you said it. Yeah, the the so I I think there's there's something about that, and when I brought up Adam, I'm sure he'd have a hundred things to say about that. But there is something whole getting you know this week I'm speaking with Werner Herzog again on mm. on Saturday. Is it like the twentieth time or what? I think you about, met him too I, when I met you. Yeah, about about, 20 years about, ago. about the twentieth time, and I I <laughs> understand that we have an accent that is not utterly dissimilar. So, um, <laughs> you know, we, but, you know, with, and his the subject he chose is the future of truth, whatever that might mean, which is mm. kind of fascinating. You always have interesting subjects. What was the always. one, 20th century something? What's the that 20th right? century mistake, which oh, was yeah. published. It oh, was really? The whole, yeah, you can look it up. It's yeah. actually his favorite interview. Oh, great. Very, it was published by Michael Ondaatje oh. in uh, in Brick magazine. Brick like like a brick. Yep. You can find it. It's online. I think you'd enjoy it because okay. he has fabulous things to say there. Really interesting. Um, but, you know, one thing you wanted to bring up in your preliminary comments was what happens in in conversation and what what is it that 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 conversation reveals and i've come up as you know i'm a quotomaniac by profession and there's mm -hmm. there's there's a line that i adore andrea which is um a line from tristor tsara one of the founders mm -hmm. of dadaism um and he says that thought is made in the mouth And I love that. I love that. It's probably not true completely because it's, <laughs> it's made in many other places. Mm -hmm. But it is also made, if you think of it in a in a philosophically Greek context of the dialogues and the whole notion of what happens, or if you think of it with Bakhtin in mind and the dialogical imagination, and you think of le va et vient, the coming, uh, you know, the exchange. Mm. I think something happens when we talk to each other. We are, human beings are creatures who talk to each other. Yeah, I think I would say that makes sense. If you understand talk as an embodied act, it's movement for me. That's why I brought up the stuff about walking and even with Herzog, the way he creates worlds or spaces or landscapes, this physical, mental, emotional kind of way that we move. For me, that's what thinking is. And I guess speaking like language and conversing is is a form of movement through a space, isn't it? I mean, do you think about that when you're Very much. doing your conversations that Very you're much. actually in a landscape? Yeah. Um. I'm writing this down because I love it. <laughs> In a, and one of the titles of uh, a conversation I had with Werner, you can find all of these things online, uses the word landscape. Oh, great. I have to as, hear as that one. Title. You'll find it. But I think um, you were already talking about that even in New York with him. Because, we were. Yeah, and in a, way, yeah. I, in a way, I'm still talking about yeah, it. Yeah, it's similar. I, have, I haven't progressed. Um, you know, in many ways. Well, it's just that. Yeah, these things change and it gets deeper. Yeah, yeah and there's more to talk but, about. You know, I, I think so. And I think body language mm -hmm. matters to me enormously. Mm -hmm. And so, um, for instance, yesterday I was speaking to the man to the man who's organizing the conversation with Werner, and he works for the Thomas Mann House. Oh. Thomas Mann lived um in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. uh, the Pacific Palisades. Do you ever come out here? I do sometimes. Yeah, I haven't been there in a while. But funny you just bring that up because I just met. An, I actually I just met this person. He's not. I don't know him so well. But he was just saying he's going there for the the Thomas Mann House now has fellowships apparently. Or yes, something. who is yeah. that? I can't remember his name. It was at a conference thing, and he was just 
telling me he's going to go to the but you model. you should look into it because you mm. could maybe get a residency there yeah i should look at that you but should anyway. look at look so at it he, look at it but you know so he asked me yesterday so we're doing this at red cat which is right next to disney hall a little black box theater about 300 people which you know sold out with vanna literally in yeah two yeah. minutes I Two minutes, it's probably, literally. Yeah. I mean, gone. <laughs> but it was the same thing at the Royal Festival Hall, where there were three thousand people gone. He just yeah. intrigues people forever. Mm -hmm. And um, he asked me, "So, how would you like the setup?" And I said, "I'm glad you asked. I want two chairs, two tables, and I, I want the ta the tables, the chairs to face each other as much as possible, without you know being like this, but like this." Hmm. And open I, to because, the audience because i want to look into the eyes of my opponent, ah, opponent. i didn't use the word opponent mm. of course i don't believe he's an opponent but i i i, I want something to... interesting though you guys yeah. do have a bit of a it's not a sparring but there's but we do have a sparring yeah. and well, there's something you know, there. competitive yeah, there's something. almost in a way yeah even something... with just quotes and words and yeah ideas of course yeah <laughs> in and, a great and, you way know, he, yeah and I, you know, I will, I will use for him the wonderful line he has, which sounds like Hölderlin, but isn't. He says, "The poet must not avert his eyes." Oh, that's great. Who says that? It sounds like him, though. It, it's Hölderlin, through through Herzog, through Kurosawa. Mm. It's you know, various people have said it. Mm, Hölderlin, I love we don't, him. You know, but I think it, I think it. it's, I think it's right. I think it's correct. You've had co these amazing conversations with Verner since I first met you, which, as I think we said before we came on, has been over been a long time. So you've been having these conversations with him regularly. He's not the only one. There's kind of, if we made a list of everyone you've talked to, it would sort of be a list of like the most influential people of the past decade or something, right? But how did you get there, Paul, from s traveling around, hitchhiking, studying philosophy with Foucault? I mean, did you envision this path? Did you have a vision? No, what was I, the I think, landscape? <laughs> I, I, I think, you know, uh, when I studied law and philosophy, I abandoned law very quickly. It wasn't cut out for it at all. Studied philosophy with all these fancy people. Because I was born in the United States, I had an American, I have an American passport. I was born in Houston, Texas, where I spent four very important days, the memory of which is slight. We moved Four days? Oh, I didn't know it was days, that short. Days, days, So your parents uh, came from Mexico to Houston, had you, just, and then left. More left. Like. Just had me because I had a medical condition, RH negative, oh. blood condition, and they decided my father didn't trust the me medical establishment in Mexico. He was right. Had me in America, had an American uh, child, perhaps partly because he couldn't come into America during the war, which is another whole story, mm -hmm. but then got back to America by having a child who is American. Um, and then it became quite quite obvious that jobs in, in Europe teaching um, would probably not be many with how, how impossible, let's say, in France it would have been. So off I went to do a comparative study of comparative literature departments, hitchhiked around the U.S. to go to various universities, Princeton and Yale and Harvard and Penn and Michigan and God knows what, got into Princeton because of Foucault's letter, studied complete there, then taught at various fancy universities um, for a while. And I think, um, I think by somewhat by by necessity, because I wasn't cut out either for the publish or perish. Um, I think I'd rather perished than published. You mean the I, whole academic, you have to publish The whole papers, academic, blah, the, blah, blah. Yeah. yeah, the the politics of petty difference. The, the, the Also the find your niche and stick to it. You know, you yeah, can't, you can't I, hitchhike I that, in the academic world. You can't hitchhike. And, you know, again, my father said, the more interests you have, the more interesting you are. And Just, I, I think I developed kind of a rapacious appetite for many different things. That doesn't uh, fit well in academia in terms it of... It doesn't. It doesn't. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I never really managed to specialize in anything, even though I wrote about Walter Benjamin. And I, I, I did it because I had to in some way. And I've never, I've never been able, you know, this coming week I speak 
on Saturday with um, Werner, on Monday in New York at the Ford Foundation with Rua Benjamin, and, and the following week with Rebecca Solnit. Three different worlds connected yeah. by by the fact that I'm speaking to them. Yeah. And, and it is true that um, I was a jolly good fellow at the Gee, um, where I was supposed to write my my dissertation into a book. Instead, I met Barbara and um, spent more time at the, at the farmer's market buying fruit that I found and delivered to her, wow. so much so that she thought that I was thinking she should begin making uh, jam and so then uh, we we got to know each other a little bit there and then I and then I worked and then I started this adventure of speaking uh, gigs at LACMA the Los Angeles County Museum of Art and seven years after doing that and speaking to a lot of people there the president of the library in New York called me up and came to New came to LA to recruit me which made Barbara very unhappy because she didn't want to go there already. And he said, I would like you to oxygenate the library. That's a very important phrase from yeah, the New York it, years. Yeah, and, and then I, I would say, you know, as you probably recall, I would always say before I brought somebody on stage, I would say my make goal at the library is, is to make the lion, yeah, elevate. The lion's roar. Roar, yes. exactly. So I changed the oxygenate to um, roar, um, but you also uh, would like say you wanted it to float or levitate or something. Float right? to levitate, yeah. and when successful, to to make it levitate. And so I started to talk with all these people, and you know, six or seven hundred people later, um, I I think if you do look at that list, and it's a list I need to make at some point, I never have. I think one would discover. Uh, a, a lot of important voices. Um, That's for of... sure. I can, I'll put a partial list somewhere or other for anyone who listens to this. But what's the through line is what I was trying to get at. What was it about being interested in philosophy and literature and then the conversation? I mean, you just kind of skipped that you started doing these conversations in LA. But yeah. Obviously, like, what was the, I mean, it wasn't just fame. I, I think there might be something about you that's drawn to not necessarily fame, but people who are big. Yeah. <laughs> Um, you know, I think there's but... something to do with fame, though. I'm I'm uh, I'm worried about that. I always mm -hmm. remember the wonderful line that Rainer Maria Rilke used in his book on Rodin. He said that fame was but the collection of misunderstandings that gather around a new name. And I think there's something about that which mm. is true. I think there is something, if I have to be honest, that I'm impressed by when I get to you know speak to um to jay-z jay-z or mike tyson or laurie or uh, or verna but there's also something in me that is really interested in um in somehow unpacking people's thoughts mm -hmm. and bringing them i'm i'm to to be honest i'm good at that in a way that that most people are not good at it. By that, I mean to say that it's very prepotente. I understand the boosterism and the fact that there's a lack of of humility in my saying this. But what I know, what I know how to do, I think, when I do it well, when it works, it doesn't always work. There have been marvelous failures. But when it works is create an atmosphere or a space where people, feel at ease to to bring out the multifaceted nature of human interest and not just you know write a writes book and pays penance by coming to the library to present book but there's much more mm -hmm. there's much more to it and yeah it becomes a sensory exploration or something i mean i really do I think so yeah i really I do want so. to try to like like think of it as a landscape that somehow you get people to move through together i love or link to their own um, trajectories um, you know, <laughs> the trajectory um you know it's 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 hard to it's hard to know exactly what led me to do what i'm doing 
um but i i do think it's it's um an ease with speech though i have a speech impediment which you know used to be stronger but still is there my lisp is still there mm. that becomes part of the charm is or is part of the charm isn't it that you turned what might have been a weakness into a strength in a sense maybe maybe but I, and i speak funny you know my my younger son who spent a lot of time who now is at ucla so we went to the east coast and he went to the west side no oh, you have two sons i have two, two. But my older son is unfortunately um plagued by be having gone through addiction mm. uh, drug addiction oh, so i know that that's touched me too really? in my family. Oh yeah. Very hard. You just That's... have to persist to try to open new paths and stuff. I But I don't know why we got onto the boys. I, I think you were going to tell me something else about something your son said or said. Oh, that I speak funny. Yeah, he spent, the lisp thing. He spent right. a lot of That's time right. during during the pandemic at home and got to know me better and realized that I have an accent. He hadn't quite realized it as much. And he also realizes that I really mispronounce not only everything, but have strange tournure de phrase, you know, a, a strange way of putting words together. But I um, think that that's one thing that makes you really good at what you do too, at least from an outsider perspective, is that you have all this things that are familiar to many different people, but also many things that are unfamiliar and all these different languages and countries and there's all this movement and also there's all these other emotional and philosophical and literary landscapes that you visited and you can sort of mesh it all together and bring it close to whoever you're talking to. At least that was kind of the feeling I had in listening to your conversations and things that somehow you'd had covered so much space that you could always link some interesting uh, path to their path that they hadn't thought of before. And, you know, the conversations that are, that are successful is when a brother, father, mother, sister, a friend, a lover, a husband, uh, and even more so the subject says, I said something I've never said before, mm. or I made a connection. And, and I, I suppose... Um, what you're saying is true. There's a, for me, there's a there's a folly of contiguity. There's a possibility of bringing together um, in in a way which I have been unable to do on a page. I'm able to do it through speech. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it really is like an exploration, getting to the edge of something, and then, I mean, isn't that what you like about reading too? In a way, is yeah. that it takes you somewhere to an edge or, or a different sensory place, a different yes. mental place. It's all the same yes. thing in a way. Conversation yes. can do that even more powerful. And I, and, I, and I also think that conversation, particularly in our time now, uh, it seems like I've chosen a profession, um, or at least I had a profession until recently. We can get into that in a mm -hmm. moment. Yeah. Um, um, that is very much in need. Uh, in other words, I, I think it's not it's not something that is done frequently. And partly my ability to do this is different from most ways in which this is done because either it's done in an academic setting, which I'm sure you know very well where you go and hear people giving papers, sometimes fabulously. I mean, my goodness, I've I've heard extraordinary lectures, no doubt about it. And I've heard some extremely good conversations. Um, but usually um, there's something rather staid about them and a little mm. bit stale about them. And I try to bring in everything I've got, which includes most most importantly a kind of of listening that makes people people listen. And then another another part that I try to bring up, up whenever I can is a, a, a level of humor. Humor is very important too. I, I've often said that I I, I, I don't think I could any, ever love someone whose adjectives I wouldn't share, but I also think I couldn't love someone whose humor I didn't share. 
this reminds me of Barbara again too. What was the question you asked her before you, like when you were thinking of getting married and you have to remember it at some point. I remember you used to talk about, there was this one question. Oh, you... she had a question whether, whether I liked Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Oh, was that it? Okay. I think so. God, <laughs> how, how... But I think you had a question too. I think there was two Maybe questions. Is, that that how... sounds familiar. But I have a very you... good memory. I studied memory, so. I can it's remember in... the times we met. I just don't remember the last time we met. I seem to think maybe it was at Grand Central at that that kind of cool Campbell room or something. Yeah. Maybe there. It doesn't exist anymore. Doesn't? Oh, so oh, we can so date nice. it to at least that, the closing of that. So nice. But I don't know if that was the last time. Truly, it was in New York before you left. We haven't seen each other in California, so. And you haven't been here, or I haven't seen you here, and I've been living here, so. And here, here for you is Berlin. I live in Holland now, but I have, was in Berlin mostly. Where do you live? Utrecht. I bicycled through much of Holland, all the way up to the Afsluitdijk. Oh, wow. All the way up there to the islands. From did you could take the ferries from, around? and From Brussels. Yes, I did. Wow. I And I went over that bridge on the Afsluitdijk, and I went all around from Rotterdam to Amsterdam, oh. all of that. I did Very by cool. my on a bicycle the whole way. On a bicycle, oh, well, I had a, I had a girlfriend in the south of France who was quite a bit older than I was, and I bicycled from Brussels all the way to Aix en Provence to see her. That's uh, very that's crazy, wonderful. romantic. It's something. very romantic. Yeah, you see that that gets to something about you too, right? These big gestures that that are really coming from the heart. There's that Thoreau quote I always thought about. I'm sure I told you before this, that reminds me of, or that you remind me of, the enthusiasm uh, is a supernatural serenity. I think it's Thoreau. Yeah. Enthusiasm is a supernatural serenity. I'm pretty sure. But you have this, right? This this overabundant energy. And when you kind of put it into what you're doing, yeah, something something happens. is a supernatural serenity because interesting because of course Emerson, part of that whole group of people, mm -hmm. said that nothing thing. great was ever achieved without enthusiasm. Mm. It's a great. But I think uh, yeah, meant it in the in the sen in the etymological sense of enteos, which literally means to be transported by the gods. There you go, transport right there. It's yeah. this movement and transport being movement, transported. Movement. And movement do you feel like uh, you need to pff, yeah, yeah put yeah, your energy the, somewhere well you know uh, when i interviewed pico aya once in, in in jamaica in a festival called calabash a wonderful festival where you're in front of two thousand people on the beach and the backdrop is the ocean mm. um i quoted this wonderful line from an essay by um uh, george santayana in the philosophy of travel, he says that Aristotle talks about plants being firmly grounded in the soil, but man, Aristotle says, has the intelligence of locomotion. Yeah, so again, this idea, again, this idea of movement, this idea mm -hmm. that I would probably talk to Werner about of, of traveling, you know, he doesn't like the notion of walking. He says, I travel on foot. All right, right? Yeah. the notion of traveling on foot, which he shares with Chatwin, uh, this whole notion of m movement, of movement and of filmmaking as a kind of nearly a a uh, something you do with your body. It is. It's embodied. Yeah. Cognition is how we make our way through the world. Like th that Santayana book is really interesting, right? I, I think plants are moving, but they're not moving in the same way. And it's really interesting to think of thought as locomotive locomotion. I would say literally that's kind of true. And so if you put that in a context of something like, let's go to New York, right? That's where we met. So New York Public Library, when you were there, these events, this space, you said you wanted the building to levitate. And I remember walking in, they were often at night, just kind of after sunset, and you sort of walk, you're walking into this amazing building on 42nd Street around sunset time, and then you walk in, and, and there was a kind of sensory ambiance. I don't know how much you had to do with that, but there would always be music playing. The lights were in a certain way. It almost felt like you'd kind of come to a nice party with the lights and people mingling. The stage would be set up in a very particular way. And I mean, there was a kind of cognitive space being created there um 
a landscape that everyone was sort of participating in. It was participatory sense making or way making going on. I don't know how much of that was conscious, but when I think back on it, I remember that that movement and it all became part of the conversation in a way. I, did you think about all that or was it just you were it just in the all, moment? Yeah. No, no, no. It was very much prepared. Very, very. I mean, it, you picked up on all of it. it. The music was tremendously important to me when it was the wrong music. I got very upset and people who worked around me couldn't stand me. Um, the light was very conscious. I was always upset by how cold the room was, so I always asked people to make it warmer. Um, the images were, in, Werner was very, very instrumental in that. Actually, this time around, he doesn't want us to have any film clips because he wants me to talk about him as a writer and as a poet. So no images. We'll mm. see. I've never done an event mm. without images with Werner. So it'll be interesting to see how that works out. But no, that they were very much there to, you know, when I had Christopher Hitchens, it was important for me to play a snippet of a lecture that Isaiah Berlin gave during his years at mm, Hitchens I I was there. Yeah. class at Oxford, or to mm -hmm. su surprise Harold Bloom with Walt Whitman reading. And, you know, this was also, it was a wonderful way also of creating, again, movement, creating mm -hmm something extraterritorial, as it were. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, and you use the word waymaking, which is, of course, a very interesting way of thinking of it as, you know, a pass, which seems to me really what I'm trying to, I've tried to create, a pass through through words to a person. Um, so you go oh, from... Oh, that's beautiful, yeah. It, it, it feels that way, it you does. know, it, yeah. through through our connection now but i wanted to ask you what it's like to listen and what how because we talked about how you learned how to talk we could say it's from your father in a way from hitchhiking maybe just also from you being who you are but the listening part is that more your mom's influence or well it's interesting you know my mother when i was 11 years old said to me poorly we have two ears and one mouth probably because i wasn't listening <laughs> right and okay. and and uh, as well, and so I've I've discovered, um, and this was through social media. Somebody wrote to me and said, "You know, this line of your mother's is not your mother's. It goes all the way, and I can send it. <laughs> to you. It goes all the way back to the uh, Greek. The, 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 there's a long history of that. Listening for me is really." It's a, a form of attention. It's a bit like what Simone Weil talks about when she says that attention is a form of prayer. It's mm. really, it's what we do when we really are with somebody is pay attention, listen. It's so important to create that space where you just lean back. Actually, mostly I don't lean back. I lean forward. Mm -hmm. And I bring, you know, I, I know I do this. And sometimes, you know, people have wondered about it and that some of it is is conscious and some of it is unconscious. It's a that mix. You, that you lean that forward I, in your chair that, when you're talking to yeah. people. Or, yeah. And so it also creates a space where people, when you used to come to the Bartas Forum, the big one, there would be five or 600 people there. Mm -hmm. Wild. Yeah. It is, it, it is wild. And and that's interesting, too, about the listening, because you create it, that you listen in a certain way that your listening changes the way the room listens in a way. Did you figure that out? I mean, was that part of... I, I, I think it's that is, again, very... It's I, I become the medium or the midwife or the... I, I, I think that if it's really so interesting to listen to this see an example of it on stage and do the same. And so people paid attention. Mm -hmm. it, it changes the attention. That's what it does. It does change. And it changes the focus. Awareness. Yeah. And I'm sure that some people also, I know, I'm not sure. I know some people would sometimes think of themselves as a person who would be on stage 
in my place. A little bit like when you go and see an analyst, um, mm. there's a form of projection. You would like to become the analyst, oh. the person who listens. Um, yeah, and that since you... Oh, I rubbed yeah. some people the wrong way. Anyway, what, what were you going to well, say? Well, no, that's exactly where I was going to go because there's a dance, isn't there, between the listening. You're also kind of guiding. As you said, you're using words to create a path to someone but you're also sort of opening this path with whatever it was like 600 people but sometimes you interrupt people or I, I remember you maybe we had a conversation once about someone c criticizing you for for talking and not just letting the person talk but I've noticed with really good interviewers that they do interrupt at key points have you ever thought about that I have and and path. I think there's two, two sides to it there's one where I hold a silence for a very long time and it really can become uncomfortable mm -hmm. barbara you know sometimes will say you know that was a bit much pause so, was too long or something yeah, too long yeah. sometimes the pause actually really brings about things that without the pause wouldn't come ab about at all and sometimes i think the interruption can be of two sort two kinds one is interrupting the thought where you lose, you interrupt and you break the person's thought pattern. Mm. The other one, which is, of course, more important and better, is the interruption that brings the person closer to a deeper understanding of what they were trying to do mm. or brings them back away from the digression upon the digression back to maybe just the digression that brings them back to the point they were trying to make though quite frankly i don't believe too much in too many points i believe more in in the randomness of whatever it is that might happen um and i think adam says that when we've had a, when we've had a really good conversation we really don't know what we're talking about we've That's sort really of lost we've lost the thread did you give people kind of an outline of what you're going to never. talk about never never okay. never except politicians who always wanted it <laughs> but ne ne never and but i would do this thing where i would call the people i would be talking to or have an exchange for mm. instance yesterday with Rua Benjamin and we had a half hour conversation yesterday where we touched upon things we might talk about mm, that's, that's all. good yeah and yeah. with Verna yeah. with Verna I wrote to him but he hasn't yet written back I said um the future of truth we're talking in the context of art in a times of crisis perhaps it might be interesting to think about the present moment and what's happening, some of the calamities that are happening around the world now. And particularly, I think the, the Middle East is important. The relationship Germany has to Israel is, of course, extremely complicated. I just give this as an indication, but what Werner and I will talk about, I don't know quite. Do you ever get lost, Paul, to talk about the present moment a bit too? Where are you now? All, all the time lost. Um, lost in, in what way do you mean? In conversations with, that you're having yes. with people, but also in a bigger picture. Do you ever get lost? Yes. Off yes. the path you thought you were going to be on? Not yes. digressing necessarily, but yes. really, yeah. Yes, I, I do. I've gotten lost also in, in knowing, you know, how to find my way. And I get lost quite simply because I have no sense of direction. Oh. Yeah, I have no sense of direction, none. <laughs> in New York, which is a city where one wouldn't get lost very easily, I would, Andrea, I would forcefully walk with absolute conviction in the wrong direction. Unless the GPS in my car tells me turn left and tells me exactly, I have no sense of where to go. So I get lost in many different ways. And right now, where where are you? That was the question too. In your life, and well, in my you know, in my life, I do want to. I somehow do do feel compelled to tell you. Um, so I came out to LA, as you know, because of Barbara. Mm -hmm. In some ways, I say in some ways, not because that, because she wasn't enough of a reason. 
but because I, I had been at the library for four, over 14 years, and that's twice a seven-year itch, mm -hmm. and maybe, maybe it was time to put an end to that. Mm -hmm. It was magnificent there. If I had stayed on more, it was magnificent, but it wasn't because the last few years were sort of getting old. It was great in probably in the years when you came. The first six or seven were filled with an incredible energy, one that mm -hmm. I also had more of than I do now. Came out here. I'm on the board of a foundation called the Onassis Foundation, which is a Greek foundation founded by Aristotle Onassis, when his son died in a plane crash, he created this foundation for public benefit. And there's a cultural component of it in New York. There's a cultural component of it in Athens. And I said to the, the president of the foundation and his wife, Aphrodite, I said, we should create a part in LA. We transport goods from one port to another let's transport ideas to mm. the pacific rim they mm. thought this was magnificent i created something called ola onassis la where i was going to do all kinds of cultural events i did a few and then the pandemic hit mm. and i created this daily podcast mm -hmm. which you can hear called the quarantine, quarantine tapes tapes mm. and so 250 programs later a little over a million wow. people over a million people listening, uh, you know, everybody from Henry Rollins to Sonny Rollins to Myra Kalman to Pico Aya to Werner to so many people, yeah. uh, blah, 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 you know, mm -hmm. lots of blah, blah, blah. Uh, Roseanne Cash, I'm, I'm forgetting all the people who I spoke to, but a lot of them. And then about a year ago, the president called me up and said, you know, we're going back to the cradle of civilization. It was his mm. word. Um, so, Andrea, for the first time in my entire existence, I am jobless. And I don't know what I'm going to do next. I, I, I'm I, going to go and see a doctor now to make sure that I still get in on our health plan, which ends in two weeks. Mm -hmm. So you're catching me at an interesting <laughs> moment. I'm speaking to a few people. I'm wondering whether to create something on my own. I don't think that's necessarily the wisest thing because I don't think I'm disciplined enough to create my own outfit. Um, so, you know, um, I'm okay. I'm kind of confident that something will happen. I'm not a spring chicken anymore. I'm not a summer chicken. I'm kind of an early autumn chicken. You know, I'm not young anymore. I'm not a wunderkind anymore. I'm not a kind, and I'm less of a wunder. And so um, wow. this is a, a moment which is difficult. The hours between two and four in the morning are not great. Mm. Uh, I keep the night company. Keep but the I night keep, company. There's the line. Yeah. Remember that. I remember that. Yeah. yeah <laughs> you see, you see <laughs> speaking to me today is like speaking to me back then. <laughs> I hope so, because... I mean, I don't think it's the same, but there's definitely continuity and you still have all those gifts and you've been giving to a lot of people for a lot of years. In a way, that was what I was trying to get at by asking you if it's hard to hold the space. You know, it. At I guess you're entering a new space now. I and... am. I am entering a new, I mean, to use the word you so beautifully used um, and which maybe is a way for me to think about it. So you've helped me also through this conversation, through a conversation, we help each other, which is another, mm -hmm. there's a, of course, a therapeutic aspect to speaking, but there's mm -hmm. also one of kindness uh, and generosity, which is also has to do with space. And so not to lose the thread of the word that you used, which maybe is what I need to look at now, is it's a new landscape. Yeah. Uh, and I don't know where, I, I, it will, it will re, I mean, um, geographically speaking, it. I think it needs to remain LA at least for a while because of our young older son, because of Oliver being at at UCLA, we might as well benefit from the fact that he's close by. 
Um, but there's a mortgage to be paid and, you know, there are financial considerations which are sort of devastating. Yeah. And there's no, there, because also costs us so much, you know, yeah, hundreds of thousands. I mean, yeah, just it's crazy. I know. Just all of our savings uh, disappeared. Yeah. Uh, I mean, all. So, the, so the, you have to do something. A new, a new yeah. landscape is there. Maybe you have to learn how to read maps. I mean that more metaphorically, but no, I understand. We've been talking about. I mean, you you have this richness, right, of paths, and you've opened up paths for so many other people. And there's maybe there's some way you can get a like a little bit of a view of yourself and where all these paths that you've opened might already be leading somewhere or other. There's definitely a, a perspective there that no one else has. So I think the question is, how do you best in this day and age uh, pr- communicate it? I don't know what the answer is, but I'm and, sure and, the people around you know. And by the way, in this day and age, it's really an important part of what you're saying because it's probably a little bit different in Europe than it is in the US, but you know, there's a reckoning happening here. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm white, I'm yep. older, now on top of it all, I'm Jewish. Um, mm-hmm. You know, where do I fit? Mm-hmm. Uh, the problem of fitting has always been a problem for me anyway, but now there's, yeah. that added, there's that added not fitting, and people are coming not to the rescue because we can't be rescued, but for instance, on Sunday, nobody knows this except for Barbara and now you. So you have a way too, by the way. <laughs> yes. On <laughs> yes. On Sunday, just before I go to New York, uh, a group of people are going to have a phone call with me on Zoom to see how they can help me. Wonderful. So yeah. people are people are thinking we can't leave this man. Uh, jobless maybe it goes back to the thing we talked about at the beginning too about it's hard to be have friends and friendships and it's scary to be to go deep and be vulnerable and this kind of thing i mean maybe that's the landscape that you're entering now and maybe that's the place that all this stuff that you've i mean i think of that backpack and bruce chatwin and this kind of I don't know where all that that comes in, but you know, talking about landscapes, you've got this backpack full of stuff. You've been on all these explorations. Maybe now it's the time to open up your conception of who you are and see see what other people see, and maybe be vulnerable a little bit. Maybe that's the lesson. This that's what this is in a way. You don't you, you don't have who, to hold the space. Somebody can <laughs> help you create it. You know who owns Bruce Chatwin's backpack. I think uh, I think I saw it in a movie or something with Herzog, right? Uh, Werner actually has in his home. Ah, yeah. That's... He has had to, and he brought it once on stage when I, I I think he brought it to Barcelona where we spoke, but I'm not oh, sure. Yeah. Now. And he has it, and Bruce was Bruce Chatwin was so sick. And Chatwin and and Werner went to visit him, and Bruce said to him, "Let I want to put on my backpack." And I mean, he 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 weighed oh, 80, like in delirium or something. He, he weighed eighty pounds. He was dying. Oh gosh! And it's in his movie about Chatwin. Yeah, that must be what came to mind. Yeah, that's where you saw it. And he mm-hmm. he actually um, said to Werner as he was dying, "Take my backpack." Mm. So it's so interesting you should bring this up. That's very strong because that's what, yeah, maybe you need to give your backpack to someone. You're just beginning. You're still pretty young, Paul. And yes, you have all this. I mean, you're not young, but you're not old. So there's a lot of years left to give. When do you you think I was born? I'm turning the age of a song of the Beatles. (laughs) The one about, will you still... Love me. Need will you me? take will care you still of me? Need me when I'm, I'm... Will you need me when I'm 64? 64. Oh my gosh. That seems so old when I was a kid. <laughs> it seems so old and I'm that age. <laughs> but there's wonderful there's something wonderful about it. I mean, you've 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 been alive, you've experienced life, and 
We need that right now. We need people who've experienced, fully experienced Funny life. Funny you should say this because I got a message the other day from this doctor who's the head of neurology and palliative care at Cedar sinai hmm. He wrote me a message, a kind of a fan letter, saying that he's been following what I'm doing and would love to create a series with me oh. on the notion of care. What does hmm. it mean to care? And oh, we've that's been beautiful. These, beautiful. We've Learning been having, to care. Yeah, we've we've been having these these exchanges, and I've met a, a few people through him, and we've had these dinners. And hmm. recently, I told him how worried I am, you know, financially, and he said, "You know, you will find a job. Just continue to do what you're doing, which is to live fully. You have such a rich life." That's it was true. so interesting. But of course, you know, it's. There are also practical issues I have to address. Well, I think this is the artist, the reason, emotion, passion, artist. This is the hard thing. This knowing life is so full and feeling it in full and going with it. And then also there is a practical side, I mean, that we have to deal with. And yes, there is a flow. You can get into that space where you're surfing both of those things. I think part of it is this like working with it, right? This is how we this is how we find new landscapes and create new paths and it's not like comfortable, but when you were just talking, I had this kind of vision of participatory environment like I was describing with the New York Public Library. It's well, it's very you know, you were talking about it the sensuous feeling you had yeah. getting in the threshold you passed when you got your ticket and you walked mm -hmm, in mm -hmm. and sometimes you would even have drinks and there was mm -hmm, something mm -hmm. happening there. And and the whole feeling of it and choosing your seat and the person mm -hmm. next to you and I mean there were a lot of things that were, were that happened in that space and and for me yes yes it, there there is also the fact and Barbara talks about this all the time she always says you need to go back to an audience the podcast was good but an audience is better <laughs> being being on There's stage something about is it. better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's better yeah and i love it and i feed off it i think that's and why I... it's better because you're different than you you really have to listen to yourself and living in full it's not about what everyone else thinks is cool right now or what everyone else wants you're unique you have all these different ways of seeing the world and part of the charm is the kind of thing that might be peculiar and in, in the world it's just the peculiarity that isn't peculiar to you you know and part of that i do think i remember those moments of the room being alive and I don't think you need to try to create that but see where the environment is where that's created for you I think there's a grace to it it's just who's going to open that space or where is that space it already exists somewhere I'm sure and we need it we've had too we much it, Instagram we, we, want it. we want it and we need it and we have to find it and we do and, need it. And, yeah. and, and you know to find a charged space the other day I'm doing this series with Occidental College mm. uh, which is a college out here in, in LA which is well known because Obama went there but it isn't ah. well known and they they have hired me to do these various things so there was the first event and now there's Rua Benjamin in New York and then there's okay. Rebecca Hornet, so you're working you're not jobless I'm doing these little things, right? Mm -hmm. But I, I spoke, I launched the series with someone called Alok, who is a they, trans, non-binary. Mm -hmm. It was fabulous. Oh, I mean, good. and the non-binary way of thinking about the world is really interesting. And it we is. need non-binary ways of thinking about the world. Mm -hmm. We need some non-binary media or conversations will we set another time to talk yeah i no. i just feel like we need to talk again because i not only have i enjoyed it but i think it's it's um i thank you for it yeah and th i thank you it's very helpful for me so i'm i would no, I love to talk you, to you but i i i feel like groucho marks again no thank you no thank you no 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 you remember that no it, yeah. uh, it's actually helpful um, I feel very, I feel this goes back to listening. It's mm -hmm. something that they say in America, right? Mm -hmm. I feel heard, right? It's something that is said. So, and it's not something that often happens. I think I'm more, 
and it it has to do with pleasure also you know that's who, a good word too yeah it's a very good word it, it's it's about you know giving and getting and sharing and what you know what the balance is there yeah it's so, equilibrium yeah equilibrium or um you know adam speaks, adam doesn't believe in balance um and i i understand that being off balance and i think that goes back mm. to your beautiful line of of peculiarity and following your inner demon and following you mm -hmm. know following what matters to you not what everybody else is in you yeah if you can get clear that's that's the path and anything that you feel you know i love homework so things <laughs> you think I, I might read or if you have thoughts about my future glorious life let me know Do you know you could speak a book have you you could just speak a book into your phone about well, your father I'll, or I'll, I'll, I'll tell you your life that, or i don't know I'll tell you all these conversations to my mind mm-hmm so many, many people have told me about writing a book. I've had famous agents wanting to be my I'm agent, sure, but and maybe I've never you could speak it. a book. <laughs> and I think I should speak a book. Yeah. And I yeah. had the thought um, in speaking with you that I should be speaking to you for the book. Just think about okay. that. Could do a little chapter by chapter conversations. Because you ask very good questions. And I also want to talk to you about way making I'm I'm just interested by it. If you have things about it, maybe you can give me a general idea when mm -hmm. you send me the links. I I just I feel there's something there that is close to what I've been thinking. I mean, the fact that I caught up caught on that word. You just said it once, mm -hmm. and and that's another thing, right? Is is in conversations. So mm. somebody says something, and through conversation finding a word do you know um alva noe i know oh, okay. alva because he yeah. came to interview um william foresight the, oh. the, and he stayed in touch at the you see this is another thing yeah it's very I, I just looked at his book again because he came to a conference in heidelberg and i just missed him and i thought oh his stuff is probably interesting to look at it probably so is, and, mm -hmm. and this is what happens, and it's what it's yeah, the yeah. way we were talking about it. Exactly. There's I'm all these filled, connections. Filled with references, and sometimes yeah. they make sense. And they I do. don't know things. I don't know things. I'm so far from being an expert. Nobody's an expert. I mean, that's not the point. And, you know, um, Adam has a very interesting book uh, about experts and, and, and the short short sightedness of it all. The only time I want an expert mm -hmm. is if I'm ill and I want somebody to take care of something. Exactly. Then you need an expert. You don't need them to know Heidegger. You don't. A huge hug to you. Yeah, a big With hug to you Luna. too. What a pleasure. Amazing. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, it Thank was wonderful. You. Bye.